thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Agile, for for uh, for this invitation or for for starting. And can I just pass over right away to our chair, Suzanne Arnold, and welcome everyone. Thanks, Brian. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome to you all on behalf of us all at Agile um, to this evening's webinar. So for those who don't know me, I am Suzanne Arnold, the chair, current chair of Agile. Um, I'm here to mainly introduce Brian, but I'm just going to give a, a five minute uh, talk a little bit about Agile. Um, so I'd like to make you aware of how and why you might want to join Agile for those of you that aren't already members. Um, so the information is all on our website. Um, and membership is open to all CSP members, but as well as um, I've got other AHPs there, but obviously nurses, any other profession are very welcome to, to join us. Um, individual membership is £25 per year. We do offer group membership as well. Um, if you'd really want to join as a department, and that would cost £30 a year. Um, and for those joining who aren't physios, you would get associate membership. And again, that's £25 per year. And we also offer assistant and student membership for £5 per year. Um, but if you're a student and want to pay or would like to be a member for the duration of your uh, physio degree, you can um, join up, uh, pay for the, the whole, the length of your course. Uh, Here we go. Uh, yeah, so um, although tonight's webinar is uh, free as a new year uh, treat for everybody, um, being an Agile member will entitle you to receive free or discounted access to regular webinars and learning events. Um, you'll receive email broadcasts and newsletters about up-to-date resources. Um, you will get access to the website, which we're trying desperately hard to revamp. Um, you'll receive a copy of Agility, as Brian's mentioned, that's our journal. And we'd also encourage people to contribute to the journal. Um, and obviously you'll get to network with um, like-minded people who are passionate about the care of older people. Okay, next slide, please, Brian. There you go. Thank you. So just to give you a taster of some of the um, up upcoming webinars and learning events that we've got planned for the year. Um, in February, off the back of our physio talk tweet chat about dementia and the agility edition about research, we thought we'd try and host an online journal club uh, to combine the two. Um, in March, we will be joining up with our dietitian colleagues again to run the second part of our webinar series on managing um, sarcopenia. Um, and in April, we have uh, Professor David Baxter, who is the co-director of the Aging Well National Science Challenge, going to give us a talk. The, uh, the title is yet to be confirmed. Um, and obviously, while we'd love all of these events to be free, um, we will have to charge for some of them. But if you join Agile, you will then be entitled to get those for free where available. Um, and finally, the next slide, please, Brian. Thank you. Um, and yeah, so finally from me, just that we have two current uh, or upcoming vacancies on the Agile National Executive Committee. Um, Gemma will be stepping down as treasurer in the coming months. <coughs> and Leisha, um, who will soon be qualifying as physio, uh, will have to step down from her student officer role. So now is the perfect time if you're interested in either of those roles to perhaps shadow Gemma or Alicia, find out more about the role um, and their details are there if you'd like to get in touch with me or, or with either of them about the role. Um, so that's it from me apart from onto the main event. So um, I asked Brian for a, a bio about himself and he actually told me just to introduce him as Brian Dolan who was born when he was very young and is not dead yet. But I think we all know there's a little bit more to Brian than, than that. So uh, Professor Brian Dolan, OBE, is a dual qualified psychiatric and general nurse, and most of his clinical career was in acute mental health and emergency care. So he's the direct, Director of Health Service 360 UK and works in New Zealand, Australia, uh, the UK and Ireland, providing leadership and coaching programmes. Brian's published over 70 papers and is an author and editor of seven books, mainly on emergency care and leadership. He is honorary professor of leadership in healthcare at the University of Salford, where I trained, let's just big up Salford there, and honorary adjunct professor of innovation in healthcare at Bond University, Queensland. In 2019, in the 2019 Queen's New Year's Honours List, Brian was awarded an OBE for services to nursing and emergency care, and also in 2019 was awarded fellow by election of the Faculty of Nursing and Midwifery of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. And in November 2021, we were thrilled when Brian became honorary president of Agile and the first nurse to do so. So it's with great pleasure that I hand back to Brian to lead on tonight's webinar. Thanks, Brian. 
Thank you. And that, that is such a lovely obituary. So thank you very much indeed for that. Um, I'm also going to say thank you very much for that and guiding all the team and Agile and everything else. Mossy, our tech lead, is working behind the scenes. He's the boss. He's driving it all, which is brilliant. But also a, a shout out to two people who are going to who are going to come in later, Professor Dawn Skelton and Dr. Juliet Harvey. Um, in Ireland, we'd say of each of them, there's some woman for one woman. You know, they, I don't know what you're doing with the water in... Um, in Glasgow, but there is some outstanding work going on up there. And there's also like sort of Lisa Morton, who's a wonderful uh, uh, psychologist out of uh, Glasgow Caledonia as well. So they're going to come in and talk about some of their work for a couple of minutes as well. But let us get the show on the road. This is being recorded. It will go up on the Agile website. I'm not a big fan of hoarding knowledge. I think that's kind of um, uh, knowledge hoarded is knowledge wasted in my head. So uh, a PDF of these will be made available to everyone. There will be an evaluation form. And also when we send when we send out the, the slide deck, uh, I'm also going to throw in a bunch of other things like posts about NPJ paralysis and various bits and pieces. We'll send it out uh, via WeTransfer so you can drag, drop down the link and get to that. So let's look at deconditioning. And if you look at the, the work out of, oh, and may, if, if I may suggest just for now, if you would put your, your um, videos on, on, uh, on uh, off screen as well, or you can just diminish your slides as well. And also do please use the chat, just if you will use the hashtag NPJ paralysis and agile, if you will, and, and do tweet away and you can take photographs and stuff like that, you know, uh, feel free to use it. But if you look at the, the uh, Oxford Dictionary definition, you've got, you know, it's cause to lose fitness or muscle tone, especially lack of exercise and sedentary lifestyles that can decondition their bodies. You know, the wonderful work, in, particularly of, of, of Dawn and Juliet. Farlex and partner talking about the loss of physical fitness or inactivity for any reason may lead to deconditioning. But if, the, if you look at uh, Aurora and some reprobate called Dolan, in last year we did a book chapter and we described it as the uh, physical, psychological and functional decline that occurs as a consequence of prolonged bed rest. But, you know, up to 65% of older people experience a decline in function during hospitalization and end up uh, too often end up in a care home due to deconditioning. If you like, deconditioning is the difference between going home and going to a care home. And PHE, Public Health England, there's a really, really great piece of work in the, in the summer, about August it came out, and they predicting an extra 110,000 falls on top of uh, the, the, the falls we know happening. And it seems to me that the second pandemic, the one that is not getting anything like the same level of attention, is that of deconditioning. And yet, and yet we have known about deconditioning for decades. The, just before, in, 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 um, before the NHS was founded, six months before it came to life, you know, Dr. Richard Asher, a psychiatrist, who was also, by the way, for those who might recall, he was the father of Jane Asher, who was going out with uh, Paul McCartney. So that must have been fun and game at their house when, um, when they both turn up. But he was an extraordinary man, one of the most influential doctors of the 20th century. His writing, even to this day, is considered so, you know, a first rate right mind. He coined and identified what was then called Munchausen's by proxy. But he talked about the dangers of going to bed. And if actually, if you Google the dangers of going to bed, you can actually get this whole uh, article from the VMJ. But while he didn't talk about deconditioning, he talked about the extensiveness of it, and he talked about every big single body system at a time where the, the you know the medical knowledge was not nowhere as advanced as it was now. But he could clearly see this is the thing that the, the impact that it was having. But he wasn't even the first. You know, the, um, Dr. Emile Rees in the Journal of Medical Medicalist. Um, American Medical Association, and before that, uh, Dr. John Powers, they in the, in, in the 1890s had identified about the impact of staying in bed, you know, get people in bed because their weak backs and general debility increase rather than disappear after operations, the intent of which was to cure them. You got John Powers, as a therapeutic measure, rest is fraught with hazard. So this is not new, and it feels like with good intention, we have put people to bed and we have caused all kinds of unintentional harm. 
But even Florence Nightingale, I, I'm really proud to be a nurse. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm now, this is my 40th year in nursing. So effectively in dog years, I'm, I'm already dead. But you know, even Florence Nightingale, you know, she said this is now a well-known rule that to keep no patient in a hospital day longer than is absolutely necessary. And even this may be too long because the patient may have to recover not only from illness or injury, but from hospital itself. Now, Alison, just quickly, uh, can people chip in? I, uh, because Alison is saying, can anyone help? I can't hear anything. Can just one or two people, can you all hear, by the way? Just uh, just one or two names, just, yeah, you can hear, that's fine. And hopefully we'll be able yes. to, so Beth, bless you, Beth, you're stepping in to help. So it's all good. We've got it there, that's fine. Lots of yeses, thank you. So coming back to Florence, you know, even back, what is it, over 150 years ago, there was this recognition that this is what was, it was doing to patients, not with, not with malice, but as an outcome. Um, feel free to take a photograph. This is a book that a uh, book chapter in a book on uh, rehabilitation that uh, Amit Aurora, the wonderful geriatrician who came up with the coin to um, get up, get dressed, get moving. My brother by, by another mother. Um, she, uh, he, he and I have done this book like, and again, it's accessible and it's free. You're very welcome to it. But let's start drilling into some of the consequences in pathophysiological pathologi terms of what it's doing to people. So muscle strength, one thing as physios, you will know this. In fact, you all know so much more about this than I do. But this is about pulling together um, and, and perhaps a refresh for some of what you already know. But, you know, a 1 to 1.5% 1 decrease every day per day of inactivity, up to 20% in the first week. And effect, especially affecting the lower limb anti-gravity muscles. Mossy, and I know I'm not uh, breaching your confidence because you have, you have shared it with people, but Mossy's only four days post um COVID himself you know and it really does people I mean thankfully Marcy you didn't have the worst version you know in, in terms of uh, its impact um but it is having a real impact and the muscle mass loss and particularly for older people deconditioning as we know affects everyone it has a profound impact on older people so the muscle mass loss in a week of one to 1.5 kilograms and particularly from the hips and the glutes, which are the enabled in standing, but bone demineralization. I don't know why my uh, screen is, um, my, my thing is skipping forward at times, so apologies for this. It's got, um, um, it's doing its own thing, a mind of its own. But the uh, bone demineralization and leaching of body calcium at a rate of about six milligrams per day and it also then causes blood dyscrasias where all sorts of things are going on. Circulatory volume uh, reducing. And then, of course, it means that the heart rate starts to increase. So even though somebody's resting, their heart rate is going up at about one beat per day. We start to see VO2 max, a critical a metric of cellular function, of the ability uh, of the cells to, to absorb oxygen. And once it starts to go on 0.9% per day, it's actually a significant reduction in VO2 max, but it can take weeks and weeks to get over. And in fact, I even noticed it myself a little while ago. I just don't know no history trauma, but for some reason, my knee was just really giving me jip and no good reason. But it, I noticed I was tracking for two weeks. I mean, I wasn't able to get to gym or anything else like that. But what it did mean, I noticed it, it, that my own uh, VO2 had dropped. Pulmonary uh, function parameters go with thicker secretion, inefficient cough, increased risk of pneumonia, people not drinking enough, and um, starting to get hot. And, and uh, you know, all of these things can jump. And of course, they're not taking deep breath. And if you're lying back, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're lying back, um, you know, your, 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 your lungs are not expanding as much because you're lying back on, 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 your, on your ribs. So you're not getting as, as deep in inspirations. Blood glucose, by the third day, uh, day of inactivity, there's a reduced insulin binding sites, which means you need to be mobile and active for a fortnight before it even starts to come to normal. The more and more you look at this stuff, the wider and wider the implications become. The, the um, constipation, because peristalsis slows down, people are drinking less, the abdominal walls are getting weaker because people are, are horizontal rather than vertical. There isn't the natural gravity effect of uh, the 
um, uh, feces going through the bowel. Uh, the the um, uh, it starts because it's longer in the bowel, more of the water is, is taken via the bowel from the from the feces itself, which means it gets harder and more compacted. And what it can then also then do is lead to um, uh, compacted uh, feces in the bowel, which can may require manual evacuation, which is unpleasant for everyone. UTI, because the diuresis increases, but um, mineral excretion, such as particularly calcium, can lead to kidney stone formation in 50 to 30 percent of patients. Because people are horizontal, the ureters are horizontal rather than vertical, which means urine is having to go, is working harder to get through the, uh, get through to the bladder. Um, because uh, the person is static, there's a uh, uh, bladder function is not as effective. It's, it's a it's a vehicle or a, an environment for um, uh, bacterial growth, which means it leads to further use of DI. Um, just go back one again, the skin integrity, which one we would know best. Um, you know that's compromised because of, of pressure source. Um, let me just quickly pick up a few. Let me, if I may, please uh, just pick up some of these comments. So you've got Dawn's comment here: blood pressure can increase within two hours of sitting, and which reminds uh, these things can happen if somebody remains socially restricted and to, told to stay inside and shield. Absolutely, and you know they're um, they're sitting down all day, not getting out and about. And then we need um, a, a best point. You're so right. But you do please chatting. This is great. And, you know, needing shoes because they're loaded up with um, with uh, laxatives. I accept that if the shops are shut, they might have to buy them on Amazon. And we know how that goes. Uh, we also know that people increase their fear of falling and their decreased confidence in falling when they leave hospital. Absolutely. And, and picking up that point, I've got a, a family member who now sadly had a extended family member who's now passed out, God rest him, walked into hospital, but never walked back out again. And we, we've all seen this time and time and time again. You look at the that, you know, that um, that few hospitalized older people die if their mobility improves during the first 48 hours of engine, but many or most indeed will die if it isn't. This is the work of uh, some deep drill work of Hathaway et al. And the RCP last year noted that 30% of acute patients, inpatients are in their last year of life. Now I'm in Gray at the moment, Gray Hospital, Gray Mount Hospital, Nakao, the new hospital here. They've got a, a, a 32 bedded ward. It's closed down at the moment to 28 beds because of staffing. And I was saying to them yesterday, 28 beds, 30% of people, that's eight people who are not going to see Christmas. And that's, you know, when we convert it into, this is January, a third of the people you see in your workplace as inpatients will not be seeing this Christmas. And it comes into this moment of how do we value patients' time? Because patients' time is the most important currency in healthcare. And while our time is busy and important, our patient's time is sacred. And, you know, you look at the cognitive climb, as Rohan says, the, the real, and I'm going to come into this as well, Rohan, about the real cognitive climb, the less socialization, less stimulation, the bored, they're, they're, people get lethargic, you, you know, you, you, you get fed up of being fed up when you're stuck on bed rest. There's this loss of motivation. Your get up and go has got up and gone. This torpor, this kind of misery, the kind of this fugue that comes over a person, that, that loss of independence that we see. People become much more independent. Dawn's point here, but confusion being increased, agitation is increased. Nobody, we, you're right, nobody wants to be unable to move. And you think the words emotion, emotion has got emotion, um, hidden in plain sight within it. Uh, we talk about social movements by no coincidence at all. But on top of that, there's the decreased appetite, aerobic capacity. There's uh, you know, all of these dimensions all start to, to come in together and it just is overwhelming. The, the, the consequences of deconditioning, Dr. Uh, Ian Sturgis, a geriatrician, describes it as being 10 to 100 times more prevalent than falls and, uh, and pressure sores. And you look at the work, the great work of Dr. Lizzie Burns uh, out of Oxford, and she, you know, she talked about boredom being a problem that has impacts because people feel really, really bored. This is a great little study, by the way, I think that she did as well. Um, 
and she talks about two thirds of men and a quarter of women are so fearful of being bored in a study they did in Canada that they would rather be electrocuted than stay bored. I don't want to dwell too much on why there's such a gender difference, but it is what it is. The qualitative experience of people when they're you know, of deconditioning, when they're in hospital is profound. Um, I come across a new acronym which seems to be increasing in appearance, NIB, nurse in bed. Um, angry nurse, oh yes, I've not seen that one, Vicky, that's not okay. I thought you meant a nurse in bed, as in, what, like an RN in bed? <laughs> <laughs> who are we to judge but actually that's not okay you're right children's hospitals have play therapists we need similar for adults and they do have um what's if anyone can help with the word activity uh, activity uh, um specialists which is which is which is great we know that there's this significant atrogen iatrogenic consequence for people and this is global physiological impact and there's a very high proportion of people who are readmitted to hospital within 28 days. They are readmitted for something else. And I think there's this slightly casual, some case of almost smug reaction sometimes to, oh, well, they didn't come in with the condition I sent them home and we sorted them out. They came in with something else. Uh, yes, actually, if you would, Mossy, but only if it's not going to... Um, only if they're not going to keep running on. I've no idea why they've started to do to go on a timer because we didn't do that, did we, earlier? So yes, if you would please, <clears throat> and I'll do the next slide. Next slide, I think. But patients come in with different reasons, and the really what that's a proxy for is the decondition has been global upon them. It is not just the just the presenting DRG. So uh, let me just keep going as a world, Martin, and then I'll bring you in if I if I can. Um, what we've litigated the extent of the problem and Dawn and, and, and Juliet are going to talk about their wonderful work in a little while, but the, um, the NPJ paralysis was born actually in the outback of Australia. I was doing some work in Broken Hill in New South Wales outback and his response, Tim Gellert, Anne-Marie Riley, Tim and, and also Pete Gordon, they both work for ESIS. Anne-Marie is now the chief nurse, wonderful chief nurse at um, uh, University Hospitals of North Midlands, then at Nottingham. And it was a response that it was like nursing was born in the church and raised in the army and putting patients in their pajamas as their uniform, which from Let's Fix That Within Days turned into end PJ paralysis. Because as you will know, we patients come into hospital, they get into their pajamas and then they are they are just paralyzed in their pajamas till the day they leave. So this is the thing that that happens to people. Um, I want to go back to the, uh, the point of people making uh, Naomi's point about how do we get this fixed? Well, we can end PJ paralysis by tapping into the most underutilized resource support that there is in healthcare, which is patients and their families, and often the volunteers are really happy to, to do this sort of stuff. Um, Helen, your point about people going home and being nursed in bed while waiting for hospital assessments and equipment provision, which would you think about it is just crackers and doing some work over here to see how can we reduce the number of people who are having to go out more than once to do stuff because there hasn't been the connectivity. Um, Rowan, again, more patients being shipped out, nurse on, in bed on discharge because there's no therapist to get them out in acute. Lots of really poor outcomes, and I'm, I'm absolutely certain they are, there are. And the global threat we face in healthcare is not financial, it's not facilities, it is absolutely a people issue. That means we need to keep thinking what it is that we do. So as physiotherapists, as nurses, as doctors, that we only do what only we can do and that means embracing our assistant colleagues embracing the work of our families and and, and their carers and you think about pediatrics as a really good model because the happiest pediatricians are ones who are closing uh, hospital beds but also if you think about the complexity of some of the stuff that parents are doing with their children in their own homes and you have, you have people if they're fit and well they might know that they've been with that person for 30, 40, 50 years. They know everything about them. And if they want to help, we should do everything we can to help them. A bunch more messages coming through, which is about the hoisting uh, having an impact. You're absolutely right, uh, Beth. And Beth, by the way, Kerry spoke last year at our NPJ Paralysis Summit, and you can look at her 
her presentation was glorious. Um, older people coming out of hospital having not been out, out of bed all day, exacerbating their condition. That's exactly right. I have a 40 something um, nephew, <clears throat> excuse me, who actually as a consequence of COVID had a quadruple bypass uh, last year. And he couldn't come out of his room because of the lockdowns, all the risk around that. And he was getting worse and worse. He was also having a significant impact on his on his mental well-being, as well as the physical. And that's a point that Dawn had also had picked up. Staffing levels, it's absolutely, Judith, I agree with you. It is a, one of the bigger, bigger challenges. And of course, the visitor po policy, essential visitors only, has been a problem, which is it's compounded it in, as well. Further in seven days of therapy, but it depends if they're getting enough. Um, <laughs> jiggling, as I know, at least four people on this call are sat in their PJs on this webinar. And I hope everybody, you know, you're either have a cup of tea or you've got a glass of processed fruit in front of you. So has, I've, I've got some holy water here because it is morning time in New Zealand. It's hard to know what really happens in the community because they say they don't get any physio and hardly got out of bed. And we're going to see a film, a short film about that earlier. When people have dementia, it's worse and absolutely holly, and it's really hard. And there's those gaps in the board and the social isolation. There's some work that's come out of Canada where they found in old age care residents, people were dying even sooner of dementia than had been anticipated. And they attributed it to the lockdowns in, uh, I think this was out of um, Alberta, which is tragic, really. Uh, Kaylee about the people being discharged home with hoists and, and lots of, but the care is not able to use them because it's time and the person's in bed and there's training issues. It's just, you're absolutely right, this vicious cycle. Rachel working in an acute hospital, not a day goes by without talking about the adverse of, uh, of, of uh, effects of deconditioning. Oh, thank you for sweet talking to me, Rachel. Uh, what would your top tip be to get this message out to patients, long-term staff and execs? I think you're already doing it. And I think, you know, and again, it'd be really helpful, Dawn and Julia, if you would um, take note of this as well and value your thoughts. And we'll hopefully get to it later, later as well, the time. Um, but I think you're already doing it. Keep talking about it. There is this belief that change happens top to bottom and bottom to top. Actually, I believe change happens side by side. It's every conversation. It's one heart, one mind one conversation at a time. That is how we, we make this stuff talk. And I'm going to talk about how effectively to create a social movement as well. Patients, they're lost without their families. They miss them, so they do. It is 221 days today since I last saw my son in Stratford-on-Avon. And I can tell you, it sucks. Um, COVID, we may be really tired of COVID, but it is not tired of us. I can get to the UK, it's getting back to New Zealand. So is this massive social, for everyone who dies, of every one of the 175,000 who have died, the 150 is those who have died uh, within 28 days of diagnosis. The 175 from the uh, Organization of National Statistics is more accurate. It's because ev it's everyone who has um, COVID on their death certificate. So it's probably more accurate. So it is. I'll come back to some more uh, these comments as well. And thank you for the richness of all this commentary. But what do we do to people? Well, what we do is we put them in a hospital gown. And now you know why it's called ICU. Because people know there's something wrong. They feel vulnerable. They feel disadvantaged, they feel disempowered. It's a horrible experience and you can't question stuff. And all of us have had the experience of legging it down a corridor where you see somebody with um, bits, of, you know, <laughs> bits of bare bomb exposing themselves to the world as you're pulling their, their thing together. You know, how many years have we had? 40, 50 years of these gowns and that nobody has come up with something better than this yet. And people may own their sickness but they don't own the trajectory of where they're going in their journey of sickness. Could you imagine as physios going up to get your graduation certificate from Professor Skelton and others where you're all wearing your gowns? And this is the beautiful work of Lisa Cogan, Nicole, uh, sorry, Lisa Morton, Nicole Cogan and others at et al. Um, from the year before last. Lisa has had, I think she had her first um, what's the word I'm looking for? Somebody will help me. I think it's a pacemaker 
when she was just five years, five days, five days old. She was the youngest person in the world to have had one. She's a remarkable woman. So she has left, I think she's on some like pace bacon number 17 now. Extraordinary woman. She lives and breathes this stuff in every meaningful way. And uh, she's at uh, Glasgow, Caledonia, and now she's got a new role back again doing some teaching future psychologists as well. And she, they did this study and they found that, you know, the, one of the dimensions of it is the embodiment of the sick role. Somebody may come into hospital as, a, as an engineer, as a teacher, as a street cleaner, as a shop assistant, as a physio, and they turn into patients. They lose that sense of who they are, that sense of identity, and they turn into patients. Feeling cold and exposed, that emotional and physical vulnerability, that sense of dehumanization, this sense of the distress of, of even wearing a gown, and then this relinquishing of control to the health professionals. You know, this, this passive acceptance. And, and somebody, she said, her, my, her dad is a barrister. And he says, last week he was arguing with the judge. This week he was saying, oh, do you think they'll let me out of bed? Do you think I'll be allowed to go to the toilet on my own? This sense of loss of agency, loss of sense of self and who you are. Although the one upside would be a sense of, well, at least it's got an equalizing dimension to it. This is what the hospital gown does to people. And I'm going to give you an example of a wonderful physio of how she helped people in healthcare experience the experience of being, a, uh, being in a hospital gown. But allow me, if I may, to bring in Dr. Juliet Harvey, who I've, I've, I've met uh, already once, and, uh, and also uh, Professor Dawn Skelton, if you will. Uh, Mossy, I think you're doing that. Juliet and Dawn, can you can you hear okay? Are you happy to? Hi, Ryan. To speak can you hear me okay? We can indeed. Delighted yeah. to have you. Really <laughs> Thanks so much for inviting me to to speak about uh, this work. Um, shall I just go ahead just now? Please do. It's going on okay. <laughs> so um, yeah, so this um, pieces of work that came out of my PhD. Um, the one on the left hand side is um, what happened to my legs when I broke my arm. So this was um, a participant in one of my research studies actually had a fall whilst wearing an activity monitor and uh, fractured her humerus, was in hospital for uh, a couple of days, uh, conservative management, returned home with her um, arm in a sling. Um, and I was actually quite lucky because when she was in hospital, she asked if she could leave the activity monitor on um, and she was allowed to do that. So these are the results. So you can see before um, she went into hospital, that's a pre-accident period. She was actually quite active of about 65% of her day sedentary. Um, during her hospital stay, her uh, sedentary time um, increased to about 98%. Um, when the week that she returned home, uh, her activity quickly increased and she was about 84 to 90% um, uh, of sedentary time uh, on returning home. And then um, I think the most interesting thing actually is that four weeks after this um, upper limb injury with, without complications, her sedentary time was still um, 80%. So um, I put together this infographic just so that people can, can see the impact of that. And um, it showed in her functional outcomes as well. She, her um, time up and go speed was uh, three seconds more and her sit stand in um, 30 seconds she was two stands worse off um, at that time as well so for having the upper limb injury it had a, a massive impact on her and also just as things that you mentioned her anxiety her, her fear of falling again and um, all, all these other consequences um, that, um, that, that, that she, she told me about as well so it has a a massive impact and um, obviously actually being in a hospital bed has has a massive effect on the just tell me if I'm taking too long <laughs> on okay, the okay. right hand side um, was my um, intervention paper that I did for my PhD so I was looking at reducing sedentary behaviour 
um, in frail older adults in sheltered um, housing. And what it did was it used activity monitors for this, along with goal setting and motivational interviewing. And uh, along uh, the participants, um, we used the activity monitoring to have a deep reflection on what people use their energy for during um, you know their their twenty four hour period, so we could see their their sleep time. Uh, you know if they're up in the night, um, how they use their energy, but also um, what they were doing in their sedentary time. So we could actually see um, th they could say, well, I was bored then. I was just sitting watching the telly, or I'd, I'd uh, you know just been out for a walk and I was recovering, um, or, or I need to rest at that time because you know I, I'd. It, it takes a lot out of me to get up and dressed or, or whatever. So um, we're able to look at more rather than the total sedentary time, which is sort of interesting. The most interesting thing is I think is the patterns of sedentary behavior. So from that, we were able to set their personal goals and also look at targets around about what they wanted to do with their sedentary time. I had two groups, one had um, feed, real time feedback in their sedentary time through their activity monitors, which gave a gentle vibration. Um, between the two groups, there was no um, significant a difference between the two groups, but um, both groups saw functional gains with that. They also reported um, feeling uh, physically and um, mentally better. And the um, we also discussed barriers and, and you know when they didn't change and it was pain and um, their moods that that was the the main things there. And what I'll do is I'll put the um, the links thank to the full papers for both of these into the, the oh, chat box. So, oh, bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for that. I know. Thank you so much. And, <laughs> and thank you, Dawn, Dawn, for answering Nikki's question as well. That's that, 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 Thank you. And, and and again, either of you. Oh, no, let me just let me. Um, I, I'm going to come back to you, Dawn, because I skipped. Actually, no. Let me, if I will, go to you, Dawn, now, if I may, please. Yeah. And if you're happy to talk to this, and then I'll cycle back to the Australian work. Brilliant. Yeah, this was just some work by Jennifer Scott, who's uh, currently doing a PhD with me in Glasgow. And we were looking actually at patients that would normally end up receiving a hospital at home service. And that's because anecdotally, people talk that hospital at home might mean that people move more because they're in their own homes. So we looked at activity monitors, the same ones that uh, Juliet was using, so active pals, but also other accel accelerometry. So we did a review of the, uh, of the literature. And you can see in these patients, these are not really unstable ill patients because these wouldn't have been seen at hospital at home. So these are the sort of patients that you would be able to mobilize and get up, get dressed and move. And we saw essentially that over a 24 hour period, they have spent 6.6% .6 of time moving beyond being flat on their back. And we saw that step count was 881 steps a day on average. Now, this we know is gonna have very poor outcomes. So what the really point I'm making here is these are relatively, relatively well older adults that could have received hospital at home services. So it, you know, a lot of people say to us, well, many older people are too frail when they go in, they're too ill, but these people were not and look at how low their movement was. Gosh, yes, for sure. And what I'd like you to do, and picking up that last point, what I'd like everybody to do, if you would, is I'd like you, because I'm you know, conscious of none of you doing conditioning, including myself, is we're about 45 minutes in, and I'd like you all to stand up and take 12 steps um, in, on the spot where you are. Just take 12 steps and then sit down again. So just take 12 steps. Uh, this isn't a way of us finding out who's wearing pyjamas and who isn't. But when you sat down again, uh, anybody want to just quickly throw into chat, what do you think those 12 steps? <laughs> they, um, <laughs> thanks, Marcy. What do you think that 12 steps was? Yes, indeed, it does. It does stimulate the blood to the brain. Uh, what do you think uh, the 12 steps, nothing to do the AA, what do you think that 12 steps was? What represented? Anybody? Average daily steps. Walk into the kitchen. Reset your posture. 
from the bed to come out. Good call, good one. Obligatory walk to come out, walk into the bathroom. I'll tell you what that was. It was a piece of work done by a geriatrician in a rehab ward, in a rehab ward, and it was a number of steps, and they were given pedometers. Um, and I need to ask Anne Marie what this ger what this geriatrician's name is. Uh, uh, it was the number of steps that patients took on a rehab ward over a weekend. Yep, it's absolutely horrifying, isn't it? Um, you know, so when, when you have, like Dawn saying, you know, 881 steps, 1,060, you know, 881, it wouldn't be, yes, it was, it was Beth, it was in Nottingham. That's right. It's, and, and you, yes, a rehab centre, 100%. I can see, you know, what the reaction it is. It's mine too. It's it's a cold comfort seeing eight eighty one to give or take one sixty eight. Um, it is actually just Louise. That's a very good word for it. Dispiriting, um, and they spent eighty of their day walking day. Uh, yeah, it, it's quite extraordinary. Alexander, you've done thirteen thousand steps. Fair play to you. So it's that kind. Of, that's kind of. By the way, you're not ten thousand steps a day. That was a that was a marketing thing from a Japanese company in the 1980s for middle-aged people. That's uh, seven thousand, I think, is is actually the right you know minimum for for good health. Um, but that's quite stunning, and I would love it. I would love it if we shut rehab beds because too many people go to rehabilitation to recondition from the deconditioning that occurs during the acute hospital phase. And something as a nurse I say widely to nurses is since when was it the physio's job to get patients out of bed? You know, they, they, and it is just not okay to me. And there's a whole bunch of reasons. And, you know, I'm not gonna turn this into white coat fashion because, you know, it's one of our favorite blood sports, but we collectively, why I'm proud to be, uh, the honorary president of Agile, we are so much more powerful when we are working with you. I'm only sad that we haven't many nurses, if any, on this. And I know it's targeted at, um, for Agile and physios, but we need more of this working with each other. And just, and I, I, I put the slide in the wrong direction. But you know, you look at some of the Australian work, uh, you need me, Jasper, who I was lucky enough to meet in Adelaide last year, that they've done the physical activity. I'm part of a piece of work where we're looking at um, physical activity guidelines, uh, which has been led by Dr. Claire Baldwin, who's a, a physio researcher and lecturer in the uh, University of Flinders. But to give a shout out to Derek Laidler, senior physio in NHS Scotland, who, in Highlands, I should say, who's done this. You know, you look at um, the muscle bulk, and we just had this assumption, you know, sarcopenia comes from the Greek, sarco meaning muscle, penia meaning loss. And we think, oh yeah, that kind of, you know, that's how it is. But in fact, 50% of sarcopenia in older age actually relates to activity rather than natural physiological function. However, it's muscle bulk and power is much more associated with activity, particularly resistance and load bearing. So you look at this 40 year old triathlete and a 70 year old triathlete. And in fact, the 70 year old has got even more muscle tone than, than um, than, than the uh, the 40 year old so it is not only an, an age thing and we need collectively to push back against oh it's just a thing of getting older because as the wonderful chris tuckett health health physio says patients don't stop moving because they've deconditioned they decondition because they have stopped moving and again another line of his which i love which is falls are often thought to be a problem of mobility but actually they're a problem of immobility. And, you know, it is the work we have, uh, at first it's about raising, uh, awareness raising, and then it's about, okay, how do we start to do things about it? Because what do we do with people with good, with good intent? We say, go into bed. And, you know, um, slippers make you slip. You know, people should not be wearing slippers. I've noticed that the, 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 the non-slip, gloves they we were having this conversation i was talking to some physios yesterday um and the, you know they've got rid of the the non-slip uh, socks over in uh, in new zealand now because actually the evidence was showing they're more likely 
uh, to fall over because they get slippy. Uh, so they get sticky and people are more tripping over. Or we, we say to patients with good, you know, in kindness, we say, now stay, don't move because, you know, you're at risk of falling. So they literally lie there deconditioning. We put, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Those yeah. pressure points, uh, things around the bed. So that we, it's like an alarm going off. And, and we're setting this up to cause all the unintentional harm that I've been doing. Um, you know, ha, I, I see your point here, Felicity, you know, has a patient been out of bed and walked to the toilet last 20 or four hours? And if not, why not? In 60% of cases, there is no notes written about why a patient, there's no clinical record of why they should be in bed. And you, you're so right here, Felicity, permission actually is a thing. And it's the fear and the socialization of thinking, well, this is where I'm supposed to say I'm sick now. Dawn, thank you for putting in um, that, that reference. That's very kind of you. And uh, when we when we scoop this, we'll pull, we'll come and capture some of the, all of this stuff as well. In fact, what I'll do, and Mosca, I think, um, um, what we'll do is we'll also uh, scrape all of the chat so that we'll put that into a you know, subject to anyone, any libelous commentary. Or, um, is um, we'll put the chat into the uh, the pack, the information pack that you get sent out. So question and, and we'll open up the mics uh, for everyone just for about five minutes i'm conscious of the time is what are we doing as in the royal we the collective we of healthcare all of us everywhere what are we doing that unintentionally immobilizes and deconditions those patients and those we work with if you want to come in on the chat you know it, it pop comments in the chat um there's 235 people here make that 236 um Anyone want to chip in, make some comments, and I'll read out stuff as well when you're going, going. Staffing levels, yes, absolutely. Rowan, brilliant point. We're so busy focused on the deficit thinking, what they can't do rather than what they can, or even let them get out of bed. Uh, Louise, people take some time to get out and seem to get rough end of the deal because it's quicker to take them to a place in a wheelchair if they're short staff, or whisk them to the toilet because it's easy when you're short staff. Absolutely. Anyone want to, to come in? Uh, and make some commentary comments about what we are doing. Feel free. I can see Sarah Rose. I see you have your camera on. Would you like to say something? It'd be lovely to hear your voice. <laughs> Pretty similar to obviously a lot of the comments that are coming out. Um... Can you hear me? Actually, yes, yeah, perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, just obviously from a staffing point of view, we're not being able to see patients as consistently. Obviously, I'm telling we found it disheartening on a regular basis that obviously we tend to tell patients we'll assess them one day and potentially I won't see them again for another three or four days. Yeah, so, as always. Different. Yeah, no, such a good point. Um, and they also go, if you're not, if there isn't a physio, particularly physio available at the weekend, they start going backwards. Yeah. So the progress you've made, they start going backwards uh, again. So yeah, no, you, you, you're, you're so right there. Um, taking more positive risks, the isolation pay, period on admission to care homes. That's hard. It's hard on people. Um, the micro environment for the patients we set up at home. We are risk -free. We provide coding for pay relief without giving a laxative. Uh, bringing them a cup of tea. Why can't they have a machine that they can go to and use? Yes, yes, 100%. Because we also like our cup of tea the way we like our cup of tea. You know, if it's not dark brown, that's tea. That's not tea, that's just hot water. And, you know, um, at least when you, you're making your own cup of tea, you kind of feel more in control. And you're right, Suzanne. That is such an important point. Um, if it's not working for patients, it's not working for staff. We know this, and anything that does work for patients certainly works with staff. Washing patients in bed, oh my God, now you're bringing me back to being a nursing student. And we were doing it out of kindness, but oh my gosh, you know? Um, bringing the commode, there's lots of stuff around commode, uh, writing, uh, having to write notes for every contact we have, and it sucks up time. Because um, I've never yet to hear anyone say, my gosh, if there's one thing this place needs more of, it's bureaucracy. Uh, the hospital chairs are so important that they don't want to sit out for long. That's a really good point, actually. That's absolutely true, Katie. Um, 
immobilizing cognitively impaired patients because we're worried about the falls risk rather than walking with them. And we do some work in Blackpool and they have walking trains. You know, there's little or no evidence that they're called different things in different places, like sitters, you know, healthcare systems who are observing patients. There's little evidence that shows that they reduce falls and you just got something to watch them fall, really. Well, if you're going to have somebody who's been closely monitored, what they really, if they can, it's COVID allowing, is do walking trains with people. And Blackpool, they've got a big, long wall of old Blackpool. And I've witnessed this, you've got 78 years you're always looking at all oh, when I was you know, when, when I was in my day there was a dance club there and so they, they start to communicate and connect with each other so that's also why by the way I'm a big fan of Pimp My Zimmer that was thought of in a care home in Essex and it just brings the Zimmer frames to life you know it personalizes them if you think about it if you call cognitive decline gray is a rubbish color for people with cognitive decline but by per what would happen is people would be sitting there and they wouldn't want to take a Zimmer frame in case it wasn't their Zimmer frame so by personalizing it, they started to start to use those different phrases, started walking about, falls reduced, socialization uh, increased, loneliness reduced. It was a happier environment. And it was fun for people as well. Look at this 55 messages. You're, I love you. And uh, physios, can I just tell you all, I love you. You scare me, but I love you. Because you're the people who will say to patients, look, I know you don't want to, but you have to get up. That's what we need more of it as nurses, more of you. Um, Claire, wiping people's bottoms for them. Yeah, I know. Um, if the families are, if family are barriers, print off this from Kappa. Go on, so thank you. Uh, placing upon a rap style nappies. And what happens to people is their lives get smaller. Their lives get smaller because they go home in those, in those nappy things. And it means that they don't go out to the British Legion. They don't go to Tesco's or Morrison's. They think, well, what happens if I don't make it? Their lives become smaller and they self-isolate because we, we, did, we did the easy thing, but that was the right thing. The inadequate time to people with dementia, not asking patients what they can do, nowhere to go. Um, we've designed out, we have designed out um, care rooms, you know, uh, what do I call them? Way, uh, Community rooms, communication rooms. Trudy Lewis, you had your hand up. Do please come in. Hello, how are you? Hello, hi. Um, I work at the James Paget in Great Yarmouth. Um, and something I've noticed is we don't day text or incident report when a patient hasn't been out of bed for a long period of time. Uh -huh. If we do that, it will then highlight the need for staffing. It's not finger pointing, because I know that's the stigma around that sort of thing. Yeah. So if we can highlight to the CEOs, directors, we haven't got the staff to do this, our patients are getting deconditioned. It just helps to build evidence. And I think that's something, you know, going back to your original point is that, that what you don't do and it needs to be done. I know it takes yeah, time at everyone's day, but that's a way of maybe coming about no, it a little bit more. You're absolutely 100% right. I was a, an exec director, so I've been on the dark side, but I'll tell you the biscuits are good. So, you know, welcome to the dark side. But I've also been a clinical director of a couple of emergency departments. And there was an issue the staff were saying, which was about security on night. I said, look, day text to be Jesus out of this stuff, because it's really hard to argue with the CEO for additional security if you're not capturing it. So we need, this is about capturing it, um, which is really very important. And of course, when she saw it with the following month, went to the board, it's like, we've got to get it sorted ASAP. So it's, it's, it's measurement for improvement, not, not judgment. So absolutely. Let me, if I will, I'll, I'll go for, sorry, somebody was going to say, yes, I see a hand, Caroline. Caroline, sorry. Hi, Caroline. Brian. Hello, lovely. Hello. How are you? Hi there. Um, I work in a care home and we've just had a tsunami of Omicron. 55% um, yes, yeah. of our residents tested positive since Christmas and we only lost one wee lady to it. She was 106, so she was glad to go. She prayed every day to go. But because so many of the residents um, had Omicron and the staff were getting it, the manager was terrified and just kept all the residents in the room. Because if anybody dies with COVID on the death certificate, then there's an investigation on, into it. But what this has caused is a more severe problem because they've all got, come through it. But I was in today doing Tinetti assessments and tugs and 30 seconds sit to stands. 
and the ones that I saw today, there's a significant change. So they've survived COVID, but we have they've been so deconditioned since Christmas and we'd worked yeah. so hard after the first lockdown to get them back to the dining rooms, visitors in, um, walking walking groups had started back up again. We'd got them walking around a couple of blocks. Yeah. They were doing half a kilometre once a week, um, yeah. either walking or in their wheelchairs. And the change since Christmas is, is actually heartbreaking. Yeah. It's a slog, isn't it? It mm. is an absolute slog. Um, and I think that's the, that's the challenge that so many folks are dealing with. You've articulated it so brilliantly. So, and, and thank you for that, because this is hard, hard yards. And, and Carrie Anna, to give you sum it up in a nutshell, surviving yeah. is not thriving. So, no, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, sometimes, I don't know about the rest of you, but sometimes it feels like, you know, um, hope has got stretch marks these days, doesn't it? We're no longer in a COVID impact. It's the COVID era, and it is what it is. We've just... Uh, Got to keep pushing, and this is where I think I'm gonna. I've just noticed the time, and I'm gonna pick up the pace if I may. Some of the principles around spreading the change, and and Henry Timms and Jeremy Hyman's came up with this wonderful book called New Power a couple of years ago, which uh, Helen Bevan has described as one of the most important books of the last 20, 20 years in her reading. And the three dimensions are actionable, end PJ paralysis, strength for life, Black Lives Matter, Me Too. They are a call to action. The connected is people can feel part of this. You know, the fact that Agile exists is about a network of physios and others who want to make it even better for older people. It's NPG process and, and strength for life and get up, get dressed, get moving. Um, and everybody moves. These are about a connected people and extensible, although it's a clunky word, what it is, means is people can follow your mission on their terms without needing permission. And I often say I may have created end PJ paralysis in the last thousand days, but I don't own them. And that means everyone can own them and nobody needs my permission. And that's really very important that we make sure that we make it extensible so people can do the great work they do without feeling they've got to seek permission all of the time. And, and you know, the five things clear is another example. Um, created by, by Simon Jordan, who in, in his very early 50s died a few just before Christmas, God rest him. And he came up with this five things clear. Every time you go to a beach, pick up five things of litter. And if you think about the global impact, we will clear our beaches of unnecessary litter. It's our global thing. But these are actions. You, uh, the NPG Paris, the 70 day campaign that we ran in 2018, it was an action. Uh, Connecting. Uh, the new power of, of peers about all of you connected together and enabling things to be done because of what you what you do with each other. And Helen Bevan and her team, this shared purpose, this connectedness of our patients, our families, our nurses, our physios, our care systems, our cleaners, our students, our shared anger and outrage that older people are deteriorating when we can do something about it. And the purpose is to make sure everyone in a hospital bed gets mobilized when they're clinically ready, when they're ready, not just clinically, but personally, there still has to be their choice always. And that they get that chance to lead the future life that they want to lead. Like the 106 year old that you, you spoke about, she felt she had done her time. You know, here's the thing you can do with the family as a, as a, a party, a little party thing. Ask them, if you were at a, at a birthday party and everyone was exactly the same age, what age would they have to be to for that 50% of them would not be around the following year? So throw it in the, your answer in the chat box, if you will. What age would everyone whose birthday it is today, would they be if for 50% of them to have passed by next year? What age would, that, would they be at that party? You're throwing a party and they're all the same age, all blown out the candles and 50% of them won't be around next year. And I note most of you, most of you are going into the 80s, a couple into the 90s and even the high 90s. The answer, in fact, is 104. 
if you think about life expectancy for a woman who's 83, when you hit to 83, you know, 50% of people don't die after the age of 83. So, you know, as you know from your experience, it's 104. When you hit 104, 50% of those who are 104 um, don't make it to 105. And then obviously it's a smaller and smaller number. But it's a big number, isn't it? It's a much bigger, a much, much older than we thought. So you've tried that uh, with, your, with your loved ones. What did you learn? Nothing. But let me tell you about age and, what, and birthday parties. So let us keep going. So, like, you know, again, the connectedness, the brilliant work of, 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 um, uh, of the folk in Alberta. And they, they made it very Canadian. You know, I'm a Lombard. Jack and I'm okay. And they've done some wonderful work and is in Australia, New Zealand, and everyone else. And yes, I do too, Don, by the way. That's a connection that's really important. We don't make decisions rationally, we make them emotionally and apply post hoc rationalization to justify what can be a terrible decision. And anyone who's had a terrible car that you loved, you know that, you know this stuff, you know. Deconditioning causes harm and that steals people's time and they deserve better than that. Time theft is not okay because time is the most important currency. Their, our time is important, their time is sacred. And the biggest changes, and it goes back to the question that was asked earlier, big changes, the big cultures, they start some way, first with one, then another, making a stand, and then 15 year old decided not to go to school on a Friday. And then with no time, Greta Thunberg is leading the climate change. This is one then 15 year old, now 19. Rosa Parks, a lifelong activist, where she sat on a bus on the 1st of December, 1955 and said, I am not moving. She was not making a point that night. She was had a lifetime experience of doing the right thing. But that was the time she said, this wasn't tired. I've just had enough. And where another young Black Baptist minister whose life was celebrated yesterday, Memel Kemal, Martin Luther King, who was also in Montgomery, Alabama, within days they'd, they were campaigning. They did a bus strike, which went on for a whole year. She was the spark that lit the flames of the civil rights movement, a 42-year-old introvert seamstress. But... If you're building a social movement, when Martin Luther King on the 28th of August, 1963, he came up to the podium, he didn't say, man, you should see my project plan and those Gantt charts I've got to show you, they're amazing. You should see my spreadsheet. He didn't talk about that. He didn't talk about technical. He talked about his dream of belief that his four young daughters could play with four white children and they'd be judged not on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. The sons of slaves and the sons of slave owners would sit around the table and break breads together. That's what he dreamed of, because when we talk about hearts and minds, it is in that order for a reason, because we don't communicate nearly enough. We know this stuff in our heads, but actually others don't. So we under communicate by a factor of 10. We can't over communicate. And just because people are asking questions doesn't mean they're against it. It often means they're processing. They need to understand. And they have questions that are they're trying to in, internalize and understand. Do some work here about red to green, which many of you are familiar with, a red day and a green day, the green day adding value. And did an exercise where we did the MDT, uh, about a half a dozen of those patients. Um, and they were fantastic because as they were doing, oh, could that patient be a red day or a green day? They started to internalize why this stuff really matters. And they were a brilliant bunch of physios, nurses, social workers, OTs, doctors. They were asking lots of questions, but they didn't come from a resistance. But never, ever underestimate the power of permission giving. If you're a senior physio, give your junior support and support. Because anyone who is in a leader role, and leader isn't a job title, leader is a set of behaviors. But a, what a leader really is, is about a, being a director of permission giving. Because it takes time. And if you need reasons why all this stuff matters, Patients' time is the most important currency in healthcare. 48% of people over 85 will die within one year of a hospital admission. The wonderful work done in Scotland um, by, by Clark et al. Dawn's point, absolutely. Share the story, share the great stories. And it, it, it's, to my mind, it settles on this question. If you had a thousand days left to live, how many would you choose 
to spend in a hospital setting. So where did we get to with our, I'm going to whip through these, we, with our 70-day campaign where we had over 700,000 patients dressed and mobilized, the number of patients waiting more than 21 days reduced, it's seven days reduced by 5,000. Number of bed space occupied reduced. Those are the connectedness. And then the extensibility is the local challenges. We have said to patients, come into hospital, you'll be safe there. And now we're going, yeah, about that. We've said to patients for decades, uh, take the clothes home. Now we're saying, yeah, about that too. And now we're saying we're re-educating, having a conversation with the public. We are like um, Sonia Sparkle, soniasparkle.com, wonderful website. She's got lots of free stuff on it. It's brilliant. Creating, I didn't ask her, extensibility and connectedness is people saying, I really want to be part of this and this is what I can bring to the party. These are things that she created. These, the cognitive shift that occurs when you see somebody in a paid pajamas as opposed to their own clothes. And that shift occurs not just with the patients and their families, but clinical staff too. In the blue on the right standing up is the fabulous Chloe, um, uh, Chloe Harris, who was then a couple of years ago, a new grad physio, and she said, what would it be like for staff to wear pajamas? What would that be like? And if you see the guy on the left hand side, as we're all looking at the screen, that's a, a 50 year old staff nurse. Yeah, I know you're, what you're thinking, because I've been thinking that too. But she says, if you saw him in his RN uniform, staff nurse uniform, you wouldn't recognize the guy because they do. They make us older, don't they? And I love this. And, and she was the spark that lit the thing that other people were doing. And these are some images from around the NHS. Look, I love this picture on the bottom right. You know, on the left, you've got the physios having fun with the patient, which is gorgeous. Patient being front and center. And on the, on the right hand side um, in the picture, you'll see the second from the right. After years of searching, we finally found Wally. So that's, all, that's been good to know. Um, having, having the crack, the Irish variety, by the way, not the drugs. This is in Melbourne. And, and Raj, uh, he had come to work in his PJs and he pulled it off the motorway. And said, Please, God, let it be today. This is the day that we're supposed to be doing that. On the right, by the way, this picture, this is the executive team. The big, big, tall bear of a man is the lovely Russell Harrison. He, he um, came to work in his PJs too. And they, I was talking to their exec on recently. They said they still talk about it two or three years earlier. And the um, James Podgett, the East of England deconditioned games, you have been outstanding, the work you have done. You've been really, really, really great. Um, we, the, the guy I'm, I'm, I'm standing beside in my wee, really winky number, we got him an urgent uh, podiatry referral because I'm not sure that those are his slippers. Uh, the bottom right is there from, from Lewis, uh, from Lewis and having the crack with uh, creating songs I, I i didn't know i could do this but i rewrote the words of bohemian rhapsody you know is this the real life or pj fantasy caught in a pat slide no escape from reality pajamas just killed a man put some pjs on his bed made him wear him now he's dead and it's about having the joy the the dolan sisters uh coming up and singing it and and this is the thing Change doesn't have to be dour. Change can be joyous and connected. And, and right now, God knows we need some joy, don't we? We all truly, truly do. I love this, the Jerry Olympics. What a great name. That is brilliant. Get moving and moving is fun, 100%. Uh, Donald wears your trousers from the beautiful Derek Laidler. And they even sang a song that changed the words to it. So all of this sort of stuff that you can make fun. There you go. <laughs> Just a quick, quick bit of Andy. Uh, Linda Holt, brilliant Linda Holt, uh, CEO of Health Service 360, emergency nurse the background as well. Uh, wonderful, wonderful leader. She and I have been doing the NPJ Paralysis uh, um, Global Summits. I know, Juliet, you've spoken, Dawn, you're, you're on the list, you know, so it's been fun. And, and Beth Carey and others have spoken to it as well. Um, this is all accessible. All these presentations are free and available to you. But then, then we've got this. Yes, please, God, there will be Louise. Yes, probably July, I think, there will be a summit again. You know, the upended rituals, there's nothing more painful than, as I did, and many, 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 too many of you will have done, watching my auntie's funeral online. Our two daughters couldn't get back from London to be with their mother, and, and the trauma that that causes people, um, the loneliness. I like the Irish phrase, they don't talk shielding, they talk cocooning. 
Lisa Morton's got this beautiful phrase, which is about protecting endangered species because she's clinically critically vulnerable. This is the stuff that we deal in. What I want to show you is a short film about loneliness and social isolation. We'll settle down, Frankie. Great. We'll leave it to that. No message. Please leave your message after the beep. Hi. I think I missed you again. I'm back home from hospital now. I'm doing all right. They said to take it easy for a few weeks, but I'll be okay. How's things with you? I'll hopefully speak to you soon. No message. You know, the best bit of the week now is the food delivery. We've got a really nice young chap that comes, he, he brings it right inside. I've started leaving the radio on. It's quiet here without your mum. The hearing's not what it was, but it's nice hearing other voices, I suppose. No message. I didn't get out of bed today. I didn't see much point. I know you've got a lot on, but I wish I didn't keep missing you. Nearly slipped on the way down. No idea what's wrong with those stairs. Do let me know if you can make it over sometime soon. I could do with a ham with a couple of things. No rush, though. I know you're busy. So full disclosure, my son's a filmmaker and he actually had a cameo that he wrote, directed um, and, that, and the fabulous team of, of Firewood Pictures commissioned by, by Linda, this piece. And I think it's very poignant, evocative, but the lived experience of, of so many people. And, and you know, uh, I know I keep coming back to you, Don, but you're making some important points about it might be the first time they speak to people. And you know, I mean, Jasper in his PhD research when he was interviewing, he's a wonderful qualitative researcher. And what he found is those people who get themselves admitted to hospital because this is from his interviews, because that's the only way they can get their families to come and get in touch with them, because otherwise they don't hear from them at all. And how if you have a chronic condition, you, you, you exacerbate your own symptoms for a bunch of reasons and in a bunch of ways because ultimately you are socially isolated and you are deeply, deeply lonely. And that itself is uh, deconditioning. And it is associated with a 27% increase in early mortality based on the work of Julia holt Lundstedt, a psychologist in Africa, Canada. And there, oh, she's Canadian herself. This, this is a, this is the equivalent of more deaths from than it is from diabetes or even smoking. So, what do we do? Well, this again, if you draw on the, on on on, uh, on Sonia's work, you know, the sort of things that individuals can do, you know, to print these off in your community settings to give them to patients. You know, that, that we need to rethink who, who our elders and how we care for our elders because they are us tomorrow. You know, everyone, it, it, we will all wake up in a heartbeat if we're spared and we will be that person. Instead of giving care, we will be the person receiving care. But what we need to do is focus on what we can control and explore the things that are possible. Not the things we can't do anything about, but the things we can do things about connecting people to new groups. The, you know, it, the upside, if you want, of the technology has been about connecting people to be, I often think, you know, if the, if the pandemic had happened 15 years ago, we had no, we had no um, 
uh, iPhones. We hadn't Zoom. We hadn't all these things. So at least in that respect, it's been able to use these things. But also think about how we frame stuff. So instead of talking about false prevention, the deficit thinking, maybe we should be looking at the asset of safer mobility. I'd love it, instead of talking about these people as cleaners, that they realize that really their job is patient safety associates. That's what they do. They keep people safer. Instead of thinking about reducing length of stay, what about we're giving patients back their time? And instead of the number of days in hospital, it's the days away from home. Their length to stay isn't how long they've been in, it's how long they've been away. And instead of the hospital of home, recognizing that there is no ward like home. It's how we think about a problem, shapes our solutions and responses to it. But what followers need is clarity. Clarity of purpose is your why. Clarity of plan is your what and your how. And your clarity of responsibility is your who. And within your team, if you talk about what is our purpose, what is our plan, who's going to be doing these bits, that is the way we can lift ourselves to a place that's even better. And you think you go to work in the care home, you go to work in the ward, you see that woman feeling as large as life and joyous. And remember, anyone who works in other care, anyone who studied gerontology, gerontology, you are archaeologists. And archaeologists, they look past what others see as ruins to the beauty that lies within. That's what we, we do. Um, in New Zealand, there's a guy called Sam, whose name escapes me right now, his surname, beautiful guy. And he has done exactly that. He's got... Uh, 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 younger people and older people meeting up and supporting each other and it's blossomed into something really quite extraordinary over here. But in the end, as we draw this towards its end, it's about valuing patients' time. And to my mind, care will always be more important than cure. We, we, don't, we don't have intensive cure units, we have intensive care units. Because, you know, Death can, and, and indeed in the end, it must intervene. And there is only so much cure any of us can have. But the need for care is endless from before we're born to after we pass. Care has no ceiling. It has no limits. It is what matters to us. It is what makes us human. And that survival, you know, the, 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 um, Anthropologist Margaret Wood Mead was apocalyptically asked, apocryphally asked, when did she think civilization started? And everyone thought, well, maybe it's, you know, when they, they were able to create fire or make tools. And she said, is when they found a broken bone that had healed. And she said, in the wild, no animal survives a broken home, a broken bone. They either starve of to death or they die of dehydration or they are eaten but to survive a broken heart bone meant that somebody looked after that person to the point at which the bone could heal and that was the hallmark of civilization but it was also the hallmark of caring that's what brings us together because if you think about it you know there's some people who are so poor that all they have is money and you think across the NHS, across health systems all over the world, every day we undertake a million acts of kindness, where we value patients' time, where we give them the dignity and autonomy, we give them respect and attention, we give them that human connection. And we also get reminded of those days we go to work and think, oh God, I love what I do. I, I don't just care for the patients, I really care about them too the difference that I'm making. And you know, one day we will all be in our last thousand days and we'll be able to look back and say, I never got rich or famous, but I mattered. I mattered to my family, I mattered to the community, I mattered to the uniform I so proudly wore, I mattered. And if you can say I was loved, I was, I was a social millionaire, I, I, I cared about others, I made a difference, I was enough, then actually you have lived that life of that social millionaire. 
because in the end, you know, it's not they that stop us. It won't be COVID. This too will pass. It will. But it's not they that stop us thing, doing things. Often what stops us most is us. Because in the end, it's not the mountain we conquer. It's ourselves. So thank you so much for the generosity of your time on a, on a dark Tuesday night or Wednesday night, or Tuesday night in January. And thank you for everything and for all your contributions. And, and all of these comments and content being absolutely fabulous. We'll open up the, the, the microphones to everyone, anyone wants to, to chip in. We've got about five or six minutes left, three or four minutes left. So comments, observations, everything's all very welcome. Can I just say a huge thank you, Brian, on behalf of Agile and everyone who's attended. It's just been a, a great session. I hope everybody agrees. Um, yeah, so if anyone's got any final comments or, or questions for Brian, just turn your camera on or pop it in the chat. That'd be great. Oh, I forgot to add, by the way, there's a book coming. Shame on, <laughs> shameless, shameless plug. At the moment, we're calling it Dear Deconditioning. I've just realised, so thank you, Massey, for putting that slide in. And uh, this is a very much a rough, rough thing, you know, by uh, design of it, but it will come up. But it's about, you know, it's a letter to deconditioning. You know, dear deconditioning, the game is up. This is an expose of your impact and how we're going to collectively reduce it. You know, so it'll cover uh, all of that path of physiology. It'll talk about how do you end PJ paralysis. It'll give lots of references to the amazing work that, that, that you know, Dawn and, and Juliet and, uh, and, and, and so many great people that these and others have been doing and acknowledging that wonderful work that you all do. And then how do you do, you know, answering the question, what is it you could do as an individual to make a difference? So that's that's uh, the book. It'll, it'll be short. It'll only be about 10,000 words. I got a bit of a run on myself. I did about 4,000 in a week and then stopped two weeks ago. But look, we all know what that's like when, uh, when we're writing. But yes, it'll be available to everyone. We'll, we'll email you all to let you know. So, uh, I, yeah, Dawn, thank you. That's that's very gracious, and as as, as, as your own as well. Um, and thank you for Wales. That's nice to get. Thank you. It's um, it's a joy. We didn't know it would be this. How many of you would come? Um, it's just so fabulous to see so many of you, and in your own time, the generosity of your own time, at a busy time as well. So, um, know that you're making a really really big difference, and. You know, nearly 250 people. That is, that is quite impressive. Uh, socially distanced by Zoom. A number of you in your pajamas. Some of you cups of tea. Some of you with your part of your five a day called processed fruit. All of you making a difference. Stay safe. May the most negative thing happen to be to happen to you this year be your your PCR and your LFTs. And uh, thank you all for the generosity of your amazing comments and chipping in and, and your passion for, for, being, for doing all you do. And I'll leave the very last words to Suzanne. Yeah, just again to say huge thank you to Brian um, and for everyone, to, to Dawn and Juliet as well for their time and uh, for everyone for, for commenting in the chat. I've seen um, one comment there about how do we go about sharing ideas. So leave that with us at Agile and we will try and figure out some way of doing that. Um, and just to say that the, the talk has obviously been recorded and we're hoping once it gets edited, Brian's going to do some magic that way. We're, um, we will, we're setting up a YouTube channel for Agile. We, well, we're hoping to and we will get it out on there and any other way that we can. So, Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. It's exactly nine o'clock and time to <laughs> Thank you. go on time. Bye. Nobody minds finishing on time. Stay safe. God bless. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.